Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gillow, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School here at Washington University in St. Louis. Welcome to today's program. Uh, for those of you joining on the Zoom webinar, you probably know this by now, but the question often comes up, we can't see you in the audience. We can't hear you. We also can't call on raised hands, but the chat feature is enabled on Zoom and we're loving um, the greetings like Deirdre just said, happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday to you, Deirdre, um, and to the rest of the group. We're gonna have some time for questions. Comments are welcome as we go. So please do participate. And folks joining us on YouTube, want to extend a special welcome to you and also just make you aware that we're not able to moderate Q&A on YouTube. Um, so sorry about that, but at least letting you know from the, the get-go. Get uh, before we get started, I want to let you know what's coming up on Open Classroom. We, we get busy, we stay busy. We'll be back on, on Thursday of this week, that's October the 21st. Associate Professor of the Practice Ryan Lindsay is giving a talk on engaging families in, presenting, in preventing youth suicide. Um, and then on Monday next week, October 25th, we're doing a program called Advocacy and Allyship, Welcoming Afghans to St. Louis. That's going to be a panel discussion about a ref refugees and immigrants arriving in our area, hopefully a challenge to each of us that lives here in the St. Louis area about what we can do to welcome these new neighbors. But now to start today's program, I'm joined by Veta Thompson. She's the E. Desmond Lee Professor of Racial and Ethnic Diversity. She's our Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion here at the Brown School. So it's fitting that she's one of our leaders regarding inclusion of people with disabilities in this community. Please join me in welcoming Veta to kick us off. Thank you, Janet. And I have to say happy Tuesday. And I am very happy to be here. It took a bit, but we made it. So on behalf of the Brown School, good afternoon. As many of you know, the Brown School holds social justice and equity as guiding principles in our work. And, the, and these values direct all of the work that we do. Leading in this area is an important feature of the Brown School's history and its mission. Our commitment is not just to diversity, but to inclusivity, which means acknowledging that the land we exist on was ancestral lands of native people who were removed unjustly and that this and other communities are the beneficiaries. It means we respectfully use the preferred names and pronouns of all of those with whom we interact in any way. Um, it also means that we work to assure that all feel welcome and can present and engage in our spaces without barriers as their full selves. We are not perfect, but we strive to improve and we work to improve in all domains. So I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Mark Keeley today who will discuss one aspect of diversity and inclusion, um, that of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Mark has been an advocate for inclusion of people with intellectual and, and developmental disabilities for more than 40 years. He is the president and CEO of the St. Louis Art, a local nonprofit that provides services and supports to over 4,000 individuals with IDD and their families throughout the lifespan. He serves on local, state, and national boards as an advocate to constantly improve access and inclusion for all. Mark received the 2021 Executive Excellence Award from the ARC of the U.S. National Conference of Executives for his leadership throughout the current pandemic. He is a proud alum of the Brown School of Social Work and we are proud to have him presenting today. Mark Keeley. Thank you so much, Veda. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about this topic that uh, I have dedicated my uh, life and career to. Um, before we get started, I do want to make it clear that this uh, presentation is a chronological look at inclusion as it pertains to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. As such, there will be language used on some of the slides that was previously used in the past, but is no longer used today. 
I have included it uh, in certain slides uh, for uh, historical accuracy, but it is not meant to offend uh, or be offensive to anybody, but I want to explain that that's why they're in there. Uh, before we get started, I wanna give you a little bit more about my background. Um, <clears throat> Uh, when I was in high school, uh, I, there was an all-school assembly, and the uh, principal said, if you volunteer for this event on Friday, you get out of any assignments that you have, um, including exams. And I had a math test, and I hated math in high school, um, as many social workers still do today. Um, and so I volunteered for what was then the uh, Special Olympics. Um, I didn't know what that was. I had never been around people with disabilities back, uh, this was in the late 70s. Uh, back then, people with disabilities were, were uh, at a school way out in the country. We did not have uh, inclusive classrooms, so I didn't know anybody with a disability. My job was, uh, as you see in this picture here, uh, athletes running down specific lanes. My job was to stand at the end of the lane and be what was known at that time as a hugger. And anybody that crossed the finish line, I gave them a medal and I hugged them and congratulated them whether they were first or last or anywhere in between. While I was doing that, I started talking to the athletes about their lives and, and um, if their family was there cheering them on because this was a big group of people. And one after another said they didn't know, they didn't know their family, that they had lived in institutions their whole lives and, and uh, never met family members. And uh, being the seventh out of eight kids, that was a concept for me that didn't make sense. I didn't understand how anybody could not uh, know their family. So then I started asking about, well, who advocates for you? And that was a concept that they did not understand. So. At 16 years of age, that's what I decided I was gonna do for the rest of my life was be an advocate for people with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so that's uh, how my path started. Within uh, two months, I was working in a respite home uh, for uh, people that had uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, it was just on the weekends. And uh, the first person that I supported was a gentleman by the name of Michael. Um, who was two years younger than me. He had cerebral palsy. He, was, uh, he had normal intelligence, uh, actually very smart man, uh, but he had no way, uh, he had no voice uh, and he used a wheelchair for mobility. He, was, he required to total support. And the only way he could communicate was you sat across from him and he had a clear black plexiglass board that clipped onto his wheelchair that had the letters of the alphabet and he could spell things out by moving his eyes. And that's how I communicated with folks. And uh, I was supporting him and, and uh, he uh, spelled out to me, you're a jerk. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he pointed out to me that I was teasing my coworkers at the respite center, but I was not teasing him, that I was treating him different than I treat other people. And that was an early education for me that I have to treat everybody as I want to be treated. And so Michael and I became very good friends um, uh, and he taught me a lot about supporting people with disabilities. I then started working in a group home uh, for people with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. I got a bachelor's degree in social work from Western Michigan University. And then I worked for the state of Michigan for two years. And my job then was to help close down the institutions and move people out into the community, which I did proudly. Uh, I then came to uh, the Brown School to get my master's degree. I did my first practicum here at the St. Louis ARC. Um, and uh, 34 years later, I am now the president and CEO of the company that I uh, love very much. This presentation gives you the highlights of the journey of full inclusion and some stories and some personal experiences of mine along the way. I hope that you enjoy it. So the thing that you need to know about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities is for the longest time, they've uh, been seen as less than human. They were seen as holy innocents or they were seen as menaces to societies. If you've seen movies, you've seen portrayals of, of royalty being entertained by court jesters. The original court jesters were actually people with disabilities that they just made fun of. They laughed at them. Um, <clears throat> throughout history, people with disabilities have been seen as uh, either incapable of independent rational thought or action. 
Um, and society has tended to view people with disabilities as a total group rather than as individuals. Um, <clears throat> when you do that, that leads to devaluation. It means that if you see people as a group and not as individuals, you don't see their unique contributions to society. Um, so this created a widespread view of people with disabilities that they lacked basic human emotions, basic feelings, um, and that they did not have uh, the same feelings and emotions that you and I have that anybody has. And I can tell you as recently as the early 90s, local funding boards uh, that shall remain nameless had monsignors from the a local archdiocese on there. Um, and when we did a presentation to do some sex education for individuals that we were supporting, uh, both monsignors independent of one another indicated that uh, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities do not have any sexual feelings or emotions and that we were pushing our perversions off on them. So that devaluation continued for a long, long time and it continues to some, to some extent to today. People with intellectual and developmental disabilities have been isolated for many, many, many years. Um, historically, people with disabilities were put into institutions. Prior to 1950, it was very common for doctors to tell parents, you should put them in an institution, forget about them, they'll be a burden to you the rest of your lives and you don't want that. Um, those institutions were built way out in the country. For those of you in St. Louis, you may know the state hospital on Arsenal Street. When that was built in 1869, that was out in the country. In fact, you can go on their website and see the history of that building. But it talks about how you know it's a great place to live where you, have, uh, you, know, you can escape the city life and, and get support on an individual basis. Um, it was a challenging time for, for a lot of parents to make that decision. When I worked for the state of Michigan, one of the fam families that I had to tell them that we were closing down the institution and moving their uh, daughter home was very dear friends of my family that I knew, nobody knew that they had an older daughter that had a disability. Um, and the mother was mortified that I knew, obviously uh, because of confidentiality, I've never really, that information uh, about that family to anyone, but she made a decision that was based upon doctor's advice at that point in time. This young man in this picture is my friend Michael. Not the same Michael that I referenced earlier. This is a different Michael. Michael um, W here uh, has Down syndrome and he was born, um, his mother was 17 years of age uh, when he was born. And um, <clears throat> she was told by the doctors that he would not live to see Christmas. He was born on November 7th, so his birthday's coming up. Um, and she was told that um, he would not live till Christmas um, and that she could take him home, but really she should put him in an institution and forget about him. Mary, even at 17 years of age, said that was not a possibility for her, that she would never give up her child. Her, uh, the, Michael's biological father uh, met him in the hospital and never saw him again. He wanted nothing to do with Michael uh, because of his disability. <clears throat> Mary talks to me about the isolation that she felt when Michael was first born. Um, she said, um, there are no photos of Michael. Uh, she said all the photos of, of, of Michael at that age were taken by her. So she, there was nobody that could take pictures of the two of them together. Very rarely did that happen. She said, we weren't invited to parties or barbecues or any of the everyday happenings uh, where we would be photographed together. She told me uh, that when his 40th birthday came around, she put together a, a video of all these pictures and all of those emotions came back to her about how isolated she felt at that point in time and how he had no friends and he didn't know anybody. Um, there was no inclusion back then. And um, he refused to look at pictures of when he was a child uh, because he didn't like how isolated he was as a child. From the 1860s until the 1970s, during my lifetime, there used to be many laws that were called the ugly laws. It was a disability to, it was a crime to have a, a, a disability. 
Um, and there were multiple laws uh, on books that prevented people who had visible disabilities from being out in public and they were fined for uh, being out in public. <clears throat> there was most famously the, uh, in Chicago was the uh, ugly law, uh, which was the city ordinance of, of Chicago in 1911, which uh, stated, no person who is diseased, maimed, mutilated, or in any way deformed so as to be unsightly or disgusting object or improper person to be allowed in or on public ways or public places in this city or shall therein or thereon expose himself to public view under penalty of not less than $1 and no more than $50 for each offense. This law was on the books until 1974. It was a crime to be seen if you had a disability. There are more subtle ways of doing that nowadays, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but I, I reference it here on this slide on the um, homeowners associations and regulations and bylaws that uh, often regulate who lives in neighborhoods. Starting in 1950, there were families who went against doctor's advice and said, you know what? I'm not gonna institutionalize my son. I'm not gonna institutionalize my, my daughter. This is Michael and his mother. This is one of the very few pictures of the two of them together. Um, <clears throat> and they started uh, running into each other in communities and started uh, networking with each other and talking about what services their sons and daughters were not getting that other children without disabilities were getting. Um, and in 1950, there was a conference up in Minneapolis where uh, parents from around the country got together and started talking about this issue of getting full access to services and supports for their sons and daughters with disabilities. This was the birth of the Ark of the US. Back then that was known as the Association for Retarded Children. It eventually became known as the Association for Retarded Citizens and over 25 years ago, they dropped the acronym. It is just now the Ark. But that was the formulation of that uh, movement uh, in 1950, the same year that the St. Louis Arc where I work uh, was started. We had two parents here locally that went to that conference, came back, set up, uh, put an ad in the paper and said, if you have a child with a disability and want to meet other parents, please come to this meeting. They set up the room for 15 people, 150 parents showed up the first night and that was the birth of our agency. <clears throat> From the 1950s to the 1960s, there were several uh, movements that started the revolution of civil rights um, and disability rights. Uh, there is a great, great documentary right now on Netflix. If you've not seen it, I strongly encourage you to watch Crip Camp, A Disability Revolution. It just came out in 2020, um, but it talks about how people with disabilities were empowered um, in the late 60s, early 70s, and how they took that information and became uh, very active in the civil rights movement. <clears throat> All of the movements here uh, cited here created the momentum for change for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. There were small changes at first. In 1950, Mary Switzer, who was the director of the Vocational Rehabilitation, which is a part of the uh, DESE, Department of Education and Secondary Education, emphasized back in 1950, that independent living was a quality of life issue. It still is a quality of life issue. Most of us would not have the quality of life that we have if we didn't live independently. Um, the, she also taught, there, there were also uh, issues with social security amendments that started giving benefits to people with, develop, with disabilities. And in 1961, President Kennedy at the time appointed the special President's Panel on Mental Retardation. Again, I apologize for the use of that language, but that was historical uh, data, which was used back then. President Kennedy had a sister uh, who was 16 months his junior, who was born with an intellectual and developmental disability. And he was committed to ensuring that she and all people with disabilities had a, a, a good quality of life. So he put together this panel and the panel made a presentation to him in 1962 uh, that uh, had a profound impact on how he made policies and procedures uh, going forward. And uh, he outlined recommendations from the panel, including new programs for maternity and paternal care, 
initiatives from moving away from custodial institutions to community-centered agencies and plans for a, a construction of research centers that would include diagnostic, clinical, and treatment centers. He emphasized over and over again the importance of special education, training, and rehabilitation. All of these were important uh, contributions to the movement of inclusion. In 1963, President Kennedy said that he wanted to see uh, over the next number of years and in the hundreds of thousands, he wanted to see individuals with uh, mental illness and intellectual disabilities moved out of state-run institutions into their communities. He wanted them moved into the least restrictive environment to be a part of their communities. That was in 1963, folks. In 2021, the state of Missouri still operates several institutions and there are over 300 individuals with developmental disabilities living in state institutions today. This is true for most states in the nation. Um, so we have not achieved a goal that was set in 1963. So as we get to the end of this presentation, we will see there's still work to be done. In 1972, Geraldo Rivera famously uh, did an expose on Willowbrook Institution. This is the first time that there was a, a video, a news segment that showed the horrific conditions of living in a state institution. It showed individuals that were unclothed, sitting uh, in a pile of their own feces, rocking, uh, no stimulation. There was no uh, uh, groups of, of people congregating and playing together or doing anything that were all just uh, living a, a poor existence. This expose uh, made Geraldo famous, but it also brought to light the, the uh, challenges of living in an institution and the uh, horrific conditions that are provided there. In the 70s, there were also some changes to the Social Security Act, which allowed people with disabilities to start collecting SSI. <clears throat> And there was um, uh, individual, the, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 was really key in, in saying that um, no otherwise qualified handicapped individual in the United States shall solely by reason of his handicap be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So any program that received federal funding had to be accessible to all individuals. And in 1973, that was the introduction of uh, the handicap stickers that are now prevalent in most vehicles where uh, somebody with a disability. That was the first time it was used and was used in, 19, in Washington, DC in 1973. <clears throat> At the end of uh, the Vietnam War, veterans were coming home um, and facing challenges. Uh, first of all, they um, were not greeted with love and affection uh, as we often now treat our vets uh, but in gratitude, but they were forgotten and, and ignored and uh, mistreated. In 1972, uh, Richard Hedinger was a, a paraplegic who sued uh, Washington metropolitan area Transit Authority to incorporate the accessibility of their design. They were creating the new multi-billion dollar subway system in Washington, DC. And it was a victory for uh, people with disabilities because the uh, verdict was that the, the uh, transportation system had to be fully accessible to all people. And so uh, his lawsuit was uh, critical to achieving that goal. Then as we move into uh, the late 70s and early 80s, we uh, made some progress, some big progress. The um, Education of All Handicapped Children Act passed in 1975. For those of, the, of you who are familiar with it, it is now referred to as the IDEA. Um, and the IDEA uh, in, uh, accomplishments include that the majority of children with disabilities are now being educated in their neighborhood schools in regular classrooms with their non-disabled peers. High school graduation rates and employment rates among youth with disabilities have increased dramatically. Um, and today, post-school employment rates for individuals uh, served under the IDA are much higher than those that uh, were educated prior to IDA being in existence. 
Um, there was more transportation lawsuits that led to uh, uh, buses being equipped with wheelchair lifts, um, which now are pretty prevalent on most buses. <clears throat> and then during the Reagan administration, we took some big steps back. Um, he decided to terminate uh, social security benefits for hundreds of thousands of disabled recipients, um, which most of them relied on those funds to exist. And so there were a lot of people who committed suicide as a result of this decision. Ironically, 1981, when that decision was made, was the International Year of Disabled Persons. And during that year, governments around the world encouraged, were encouraged to sponsor programs bringing people with disabilities into the mainstream of their societies. Uh, that administration chose to ignore that uh, call. 1985, we saw um, more rights being brought forward. So that's when um, <clears throat> the Voting Accessibility uh, Act was passed, which mandated that all people, uh, regardless of their disability, should have access to polling places and should be able to pay, participate in every election. And you should see that now in every one of your polling places that there is accessible entrance to those, those polling places and that people have the ability to vote. Um, <clears throat> There was also a ruling uh, in 1985 uh, that uh, said that localities could not use zoning laws to prohibit group homes for people with disabilities or other types of group homes. In the late 80s, early 90s, the St. Louis Arc started opening up group homes uh, throughout the metropolitan area. And when we announced, because we had to get uh, building permits or we had to get occupancy permits in some of the houses, when we announced that we were moving into the neighborhoods, uh, immediately the city councils would enact uh, disbursement laws that said that, oh, okay, you can be there, but there can be no other group homes within 25 mile radius or 50 mile radius of this group home, which meant for most of the municipalities, there was one group home, uh, and then they would put these uh, in place. This ruling uh, we use constantly when they tried to implement those uh, changes because this ruling had already come through by the time we were starting to do this, but many of the municipalities pushed forward. Also in 1984, uh, locally, uh, the Bell Center was created. Bell Center was uh, the one of the first truly inclusive preschools in the country where children with and without disabilities were going together. Um, and they were put in classrooms according to their ages, not according to their buildings. They were not segregated. They were not uh, put in separate classrooms, but everybody grew up together. In 1989, the St. Louis Arc opened Child Garden Child Development Center, which was also an inclusive daycare center in the Central West End, where we used the same philosophies as the Bell Center to provide inclusive education for all children uh, prior to them going into preschool. The goal there was to help them to, to develop their skills and, and abilities to keep up with their typically developing peers so that they could go into regular classrooms, uh, into their natural classrooms in their communities, rather than going to segregated schools. In 2012, uh, the Bell Center merged with the St. Louis Arc to create the Bell Children's Services of the St. Louis Arc. We continue that mission. We have closed the schools because now most preschools uh, in the metropolitan area and around the country are truly inclusive and provide supports for our children with and without disabilities. Today, what we do is provide advocacy and training for those centers to provide the best supports to all students in that setting. In 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, was signed by George W. Bush uh, and this uh, was one of the most comprehensive civil rights protections uh, ever passed. It mandated that local, state, and federal governments and programs be accessible, that businesses with more than 15 employees make reasonable accommodations for disabled workers, and that public accommodations, such as restaurants and stores, make reasonable modifications to ensure access for disabled members of the public. The act also mandated access in public transportation, communication, and other areas of public life. This was a huge piece of legislation 
Um, and George Bush was uh, the author of this um, and a tremendous advocate uh, throughout his leadership uh, of this country. In 1999, the Olmstead Act, the Supreme Court construed that the ADA said that uh, uh, states, it requires states uh, to enable all individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities to live in the least restrictive community settings rather than in institutions whenever deemed appropriate, that those people should have the opportunity to live where they choose to live and not be forced to live in state institutions. <clears throat> the Supreme Court decided that individuals with disabilities must be offered services in the most integrated settings. Many states have ignored the Olmstead Act and have uh, faced comprehensive lawsuits from individual families and groups to move out of institutions and into the community. Some folks were, are, that are living, young folks that have disabilities that are living in nursing homes rather than in their community have sued to their states to be given proper housing in their community appropriate for their abilities. Um, every time a, a state has chosen to ignore Olmstead and they've been sued, the state has lost, fortunately. In 2010, we saw that the uh, Health Care Reform Act, the, Amer the Affordable Care Health Care Act uh, by the uh, Obama administration. Um, <clears throat> in that time, we also saw a lot of states, including the state of Missouri, where legislation was passed requiring insurance companies to provide supports to people with autism spectrum disorders. We have seen a huge increase in the number of people diagnosed with autism over the last uh, two decades, and uh, oftentimes uh, early intervention is key to their uh, life uh, and to having a good quality outcome for their future. And at the beginning of this, health insurances were denying uh, access to good quality supports, um, but most states, including the state of Missouri, uh, passed legislation requiring that, that uh, any health care insurance providers uh, cover all um, interventions, uh, speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy to help people on the autism spectrum disorder. The Affordable Care Act um, has been uh, challenged by uh, the last uh, administration and, and others who have wanted to see it overturned, but fortunately it remains pretty solid to this point and it has helped uh, a lot of individuals with disabilities access the, the best possible care. Also in 2014, uh, it was passed that there was a, achieving a better life experience or the ABLE Act. Um, and the ABLE Act is built upon the foundation of the current 529 education savings plan. This enables individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities to actually have a savings account without compromising their benefits. Many individuals uh, prior to this had to spend down their money or uh, they would lose their benefits, uh, their social security benefits. But the ABLE Act now, now enables uh, individuals to, have, to uh, save up to a lifetime of $100,000 uh, for uh, that will not impact their benefits, which this is a tremendous uh, improvement for folks. Expenses made uh, uh, for that benefit include that they can go for education, housing, transportation, employment training and support, assistive technology and personal services, uh, health prevention, wellness, financial management, a wide variety of things that all of us can benefit from. They now can have access to because they are able to uh, uh, save that money and have that money for the future. In 2014, there was a great law that was passed that um, uh, required businesses, any business that gets federal funding, that has a federal contract, that they must set the goal to employ at least 7% of their, their employees have to have, identify as having a disability of some type, and they must tra track progress. The new law permits companies to invite employees to self-disclose their disability. Um, and the rule stems from an effort to combat um, chronic unemployment for people with disabilities. 
despite uh, the challenges with the labor force right now, people with uh, disabilities still struggle to get jobs. And uh, this law and others encourage employers to employ people with disabilities. For those of you on this call that might uh, have openings in your uh, business, I would encourage you to consider somebody with a disability. I promise you the folks that we support are some of the most loyal, dedicated employees that live to go to work, uh, who you know, have seen their family members, who have seen uh, television shows where everybody goes to a job and that's what they want for themselves and they are very loyal, uh, hardworking individuals. The unemployment rate for people with disabilities is astronomical compared to people without just disabilities. And so this law uh, is one of the steps towards it, improving that outcome for all individuals with disabilities. I wanted to include this quote. This was uh, a, a young man who has multiple disabilities who was included in the Boston Marathon recently. He ran with this woman that uh, is pictured here uh, with him. And uh, this quote is from his mother, uh, and she is friends with my friend Mary and her son Michael. That's how I got to know this, this group. But this says that inclusion doesn't mean you pay to sit at the table. Inclusion means you sit, you are invited to the table because you've earned it just by being you. You deserve to be at the table because you are who you are. Your worth is not measured by dollars, dearest son, Liam. It's measured by how far you promote inclusion by occupying space in this world. Continue to do that and, I, and show the way for dad and I remember that the crowds uh, that celebrated you. And if you have not seen it, you can go on uh, YouTube, you can go on Facebook and, and see Liam running in the uh, Boston Marathon. Uh, the, the noise from the crowd was incredible because he's one of the first people ever to be included in the Boston Marathon. Um, and uh, his mother, Joan Devore Gut Gutierrez, uh, was so proud of this moment uh, and uh, what he was able to accomplish. So we still have work to do, folks. Um, <clears throat> This is my friend, Michael. You remember back uh, at the beginning of my presentation, I introduced you to him. Uh, and this is his mother, Mary. Um, so uh, they started life uh, together. She was 17 when he was born. Um, he is uh, now celebrating his 60th birthday in two weeks. This was taken uh, 12 days ago when I flew out to San Diego to help him celebrate his birthday and to check on Mary and her husband. Um, who uh, live uh, in the San Diego area. Michael lost the ability to walk and to bear weight uh, nine years ago. So he uh, uses a wheelchair uh, for mobility. He um, is doing incredibly well, but for nine months during uh, the pandemic, um, when he could no longer bear weight to transfer himself out of his hospital bed into his chair, he. He uh, remained in his bed. So through the work with a physical therapist um, and lots of help, um, he now uh, can sit in this chair that he's in here for about four hours a day. The rest of the time he spends in his hospital bed because his body cannot handle uh, bearing the weight uh, on this. Um, but she talked about at the beginning of life, his life, how isolated she felt. She still feels isolated. During the last uh, 19 months, she has been out of the house exactly once. Um, otherwise, everything's been brought in to the two of them and her husband. Her husband was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia uh, within the last eight months, and his uh, diagnosis is, uh, his prognosis is not good, is progressing very rapidly, which is why I flew out there. Um, Mary still feels isolated. She has four aides that come in throughout the week for a few hours each day, but that's the only help that she has uh, to care for Michael. And this is a typical story for a lot of parents who have sons and daughters with disabilities. Mary uh, still talks about how isolated she is. I was able to take her out uh, for two uh, days, seven hours each day while we had care providers in the home to take care of Michael and to take care of her husband. 
just talk to her about how important it is to take care of herself and to regenerate her batteries and, and to, to deal uh, with her own health issues, which uh, are, are significant as well. Parents with children and young adults with disabilities still feel isolated, still do not feel a part of their community, do not have uh, all the access to things that uh, they used to have. She has chosen not to go out during COVID uh, because Michael was not able to get his vaccine until very recently. He has uh, vasovagal, which means he uh, codes pretty much any time uh, they have to do any procedures. He has to go into the hospital by ambulance every uh, three months to get a uh, pain procedure to uh, improve his pain uh, levels in his hips. And uh, they were able to, three weeks ago, uh, while he was slightly sedated, uh, give him the um, vaccine, uh, which would enable me to be able to then go into their home. Um, uh, it's a challenge for Mary and for Michael and for her husband uh, to continue to feel so isolated and not have uh, the supports that they need. But I do want to end on a note uh, that summarizes sort of the impact of uh, inclusion. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the St. Louis Arc and Bell Center merged in 2012, and jointly we ran Child Garden in the Central West End until a few years ago. It was an inclusive preschool program for over 30 years. And during the last year or so of the program, one of the classrooms uh, started to talk about caterpillars and butterflies and they, um, the kids were able to watch caterpillars build their own chrysalis and, and then become butterflies. Um, <clears throat> and it was a, a great opportunity for them. One of the butterflies was born with one wing smaller than the other. And uh, sort of like a Nemo situation. And uh, it, the other butterflies that were born uh, had no disabilities and they flew off, but the one with the one wing smaller than the other stayed in the classroom and stayed with the children. And one of the uh, young men in the classroom who was uh, four years age, of age at the time said, uh, this butterfly is like our classroom. It may need some extra support and therapy, but with our support, it'll be just fine. That, folks, is the power of inclusion, teaching young minds, helping people grow up in inclusive environments. That young man will grow up to work beside people on the autism spectrum, to work beside people with Down syndrome, and he will think nothing of it because that's where he began his life and how he has always been taught to accept others. He will be an employer someday and he'll hire people with disabilities. That's my goal for the future is to, to eliminate those uh, barriers that keep us apart from each other and to help people live the most inclusive life possible. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you today. I left some time here for questions or comments. Uh, I would love to hear from folks. Thank you, Mark. Um, we already have one question um, mm -hmm. that was posed, and it is from um, Meg. And she said there was recent news in Illinois that the governor signed an executive order banning um, state contracts with companies that pay a sub minimum wage to um, individuals with disabilities. And she wants to know. What work is being done in Missouri for individuals with disabilities being paid sub minimal wage? Uh, I, I know Meg, and it's nice to hear from you, Meg. Um, <clears throat> there is a, a lot of discussion going on there. Uh, as you know, uh, there are still uh, some uh, sheltered workshops in Missouri that uh, employ people with uh, sub minimum wage. Most of those workshops are working on ways to employ people at a living wage. Um, and 
the funding sources and uh, locally there are Senate Bill 40 boards. So in the mid seventies here in Missouri, um, there was Senate Bill 40 that was passed that enabled each county or each municipality based upon voter approval to administer a mill tax to fund services and supports to people with developmental disabilities. Um, and that became known as the sheltered workshop tax originally because it was pushed by families that uh, had uh, family members that they wanted to work in sheltered employment. Most young families do not typically want that, although it is an, uh, an opportunity for some folks, it's a, a very good opportunity for some folks. Most younger families who grew up with inclusion are not looking for sheltered employment. They want uh, full inclusion and in, employment in the communities. So uh, we are seeing on the East and West Coast, uh, the closing of sheltered workshops. Um, and typically, uh, as you know, Meg, uh, things move slower in the Midwest, but uh, I uh, anticipate that there will be changes in, in how those are working. I do know locally uh, the, uh, the SB 40 boards and the sheltered workshops are trying to come up with creative ways to employ people uh, at, at at least minimum wage or better. Um, if you've not tried it yet, there's a great uh, new bakery in Kirkwood, uh, which is known as Pioneer uh, Bakery. It is a training place uh, that is co-run with Lafayette Workshop here locally, and it teaches people with disabilities how to work in a cafe setting, a bakery setting, um, and it, it's uh, helping those individuals then go out and get competitive employment. And that's one of the ways that a local sheltered workshop has really come up with a creative way to move away from that sheltered employment and uh, help promote people to be more independent. We're also very closely walk, watching the Better Care, Better Jobs Act, uh, this $3.5 trillion uh, proposal by the Biden administration. We know it's not going to be uh, $3.5 trillion, but there's uh, the Biden administration had proposed $400 billion in that uh, legislation to improve HCBS or home and community-based services uh, funding uh, throughout the states. And uh, that is still very much uh, an active discussion going on right now. Uh, I anticipate that the funding for that that will be included in the, in the budget uh, will be uh, somewhere between 190 billion and 250 billion to improve uh, rates, not only for our staff, but for people with disabilities in, in terms of being uh, paid a, a living wage. Mark, thank you so much for the presentation. I want to reflect Alex just saying incredible presentation. And I'll tell you, you got tears in my eyes at least twice. Um, just re reflecting on the, this dirty eye, I'll share Mark and I have known each other for a long time, not quite his whole journey, but um, just beautiful to, to see this uh, reflected back from you. I want to elevate a question from our friend Jean-Francois and maybe even um, expand on it. So he's asking, what would be the advice um, for our university to promote employment of people uh, with intellectual disabilities? Um, we are a recipient of, of federal research contracts, but I think Potentially that, that extrapolates to others that would like to affect change within the organizations they're a part of. Um, any suggestions you can offer? Yeah, so uh, first of all, if you can reopen uh, the Grounds for Change uh, coffee house <laughs> in, in uh, Hillman Hall, we, we employed somebody with a disability there that uh, desperately wants to get back to work. So uh, if you can do that, that would be great. But um, the what my team does here, Jean Francois, is that they go in and talk to employers about what are the positions that you have trouble filling. What are those that are sort of maybe repetitive, redundant, or uh, or have uh, require a tremendous attention to detail. Depending on the the position, we can identify people with skill sets that can fill those positions. We had a law firm locally that uh, thought they were doing something nice. They decided they were gonna employ somebody with autism. And so they came to us and they asked us to find somebody with autism. And so we found a great candidate and um, what they used that person to do was to enter all the uh, expert witness testimony that they had gathered over the years 
and, and code it and, and, and put it in a way that it can be easily searched within that law firm. That individual was hired part-time and they thought they were doing that individual a favor. That individual created such a system that he was quickly promoted to full-time, makes way more than I do and will retire well before I do. Um, but the law firm thought they were doing something nice. I would say, give people a chance. You have no idea what talent is out there until you reach out and ask for that help. We have so many people that are looking for jobs right now that are more than willing to do any job that you have for them. And we, will, our agency in particular likes to help people find careers. Not, I, I don't want everybody working at McDonald's. I don't want anybody working at McDonald's that doesn't wanna work there. I want people to have careers that actually lead to, you know, sustainability to, to a, an income that they can live off of. And so uh, I would encourage you to reach out. We'd be happy to sit down with you and talk to you about possibilities uh, at the university. Thank you. We've got a number of comments in the chat um, with additional information on supported employment, um, various opportunities. But I have another question for you. Sure. What do you see as the greatest challenges remaining in order to achieve full inclusion? Um, I think there's a lot of us from my generation and from uh, generations around mine that didn't grow up around inclusion and still don't understand uh, the beauty and the power of all people. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I grew up in a rural community in Michigan where people with disabilities were at a school that was, you know, 20 miles out of town. And so um, I, I think it just takes constant education, um, constant exposure, as it does with all of the diversity issues and the inclusion issues of all populations. Um, and there has to be a commitment on everybody's level to to change, to want to change and improve life conditions for all. Obviously, this audience is a, a group of people who are committed to that, uh, but each of us have to take that uh, challenge and move forward with making sure that everybody understands uh, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities want the same lives that you and I have and to include them wherever possible and, and to invite them to be a part of the change and the improvements in this world. So one thing that you shared that I wasn't aware of, because I had done, been doing related work until I came to work at, at WashU in 2009, I hadn't heard of the ABLE Act. And that is phenomenal mm -hmm. because um, I am so used to the bad old days where the condition of our social safety net kicking in was a family impoverishing themselves. I mean, getting to the point where so little was available. I would love to ask you to speak just a little bit more about the ABLE Act as far as who is eligible and how somebody um, that is looking to that to, to help, uh, for example, a family member, how, how would they learn more and, and leverage that wonderful new law? The ABLE Act in Missouri is known as the Mo ABLE Act. Um, <clears throat> and um, it was actually championed by uh, now uh, Eric Schmidt, our attorney general. Um, and he uh, pushed for this. It's available to anybody who is 18 and older that um, has, receives benefits. Um, I am not an expert on the ABLE Act, but I will tell you that um, it has changed lives. It's certainly helpful for uh, the folks that are benefiting from it. Um, I can get that information to you if you want it. I have, uh, actually, I see that Ann Mankelsdorf is on here. So she has all that information and she can get that to you. And, and Janet, it, it's only within the last few years of, uh, that it's really been implemented here in Missouri, so. And Anne is throwing moable.gov um, in the chat. Thank She's, you so much for awesome. that. Yeah. Um, appreciate it. And one last question uh, from me. May, um, the major employment law change um, that um, allowed, uh, that required 7% uh, 
um, employment of individuals with disabilities. Yeah. Um, what do you, what have employers been saying to you are there are the major barriers to um, reaching those goals? Um, um, it, it's all an interpretation. So the law actually says that you have to employ 7% uh, of your workforce have to identify as having a disability. And how you interpret a disability, I wear glasses, so I'm, am I disabled? Uh, some employers are doing that. Um, you know, uh, I, I, again, it's the fear of really wanting change and, and, and uh, not understanding how a diverse workforce really improves every business. So I, uh, you know, I can't speak for all employers, but I know that uh, most employers are, are making a, a considerable effort to comply with that requirement. Thank so you. We are nearly at time. Um, this has been a, a wonderful time together, Mark. So appreciate the reflection. I feel like we've got a whole lot of your friends in the room and just a whole lot of champions yeah. that are There's outside. a whole lot of people I'm paying to listen to this. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they love you a little too much for that to be the case. But um, we do have enough time to offer uh, just a, a final thought. What What would you like to share with us to, to take us out? You know, uh, um, I always conclude this with, when is my job not going to be necessary? When is it just going to be commonplace for everybody to be uh, accepting and supportive of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities? And I don't have the answer. Um, I have seen a lot of changes in the last 42 years, and I look forward to seeing more improvements uh, throughout the rest of my career. Uh, but we can all do that together, and we will all contribute to that. Nice. Well, thank you so much for uh, preparing these comments and for taking this time with us, coming back home to the Brown School to, to share um, thoughts from your career. Uh, Veda, thank you so much for moderating and being my co-host. And to the audience, um, it really has been such a pleasure, your generosity with each other, sharing resources and information in the chat. Uh, so please do come back anytime. You're exactly the audience that we want. Um, and with that, we, we've run out of our hour. I want to thank um, Genevieve, our interpreter. And um, we just wish everybody a great rest of your day. Please stay healthy and safe out there, everybody. And Thanks, everybody. Thank you.